All right, this morning we're going to talk about three days and three nights in the grave. Scripture states that, of course, to be saved, we must believe that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. Christ spent three days and three nights in the grave before his resurrection. This, is, of course, is according to what Scripture actually says. So we're going to look at the three days and the three nights in the grave and the timeline of the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, as we get into this, we want to make sure we understand that there is a distinction between what we would consider to be a day and a Jewish day, especially when it comes to um, understanding Scripture and the timeline. So in understanding the timeline of the death and resurrection of Christ, it's important that we understand that the Jewish day starts at sundown. Therefore, Christ was in the grave, as we're going to see, just before the sun set on Wednesday which would, of course, make it Thursday for the Jews. So Wednesday for us, which would be Wednesday night, but that would actually be Thursday is where he was in the grave at that point, or he was placed in the grave just before that as the sun went down. So starting out with Tuesday, we're going to back up just a little bit because starting out with Tuesday, we have the beginning of the Passover at this point. Um, so this is where it all really begins is on Tuesday. The Passover dinner happens. So here in uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8, on the Passover, Christ instructs his disciples to prepare the meal. Later, this meal, of course, will be known as the Last Supper, since it was the last time Christ ate with his disciples prior to his death and resurrection. So in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8, it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed, and he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. After eating supper, and what was going on with that, and, you know, there, there is obviously a lot involved in the story. Um, Christ very clearly indicates who is going to betray him. Judas goes off to betray him. Um, Satan actually enters into Judas to ensure that Christ is betrayed at this point. Um, and then, we come back um, in Luke chapter 22, verses 47 and 48. This is where Christ actually is betrayed at this point. And this would be Tuesday night. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who, called, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you, portraying the son, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? So he's asking, you know, of course, at this point, well, what the agreement was is Judas would go up and he would kiss Jesus, and that would be the one that the Roman soldiers were to arrest. From here, Christ is turned over to the high priest. And as he, as he is turned over to the high priest, so, Christ, so Judas betrays him, Christ is turned over to the high priest, who, of course, ultimately is going to have him put to death. But uh, he has a trial before the high priest. Mark chapter 14, verses 55 and 56 state, Now the chief priest, now your chief or high priest, that would be actually the same term there, by the way. And all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none, for many uh, bear false witness against him, but their testimonies didn't agree. So they went out and they found a bunch of people who would actually bear a false testimony against Christ, but the problem was nobody was agreeing on what was actually the problem at all. You know, this, by the way, and like I said, I don't really have enough time to go into all the details here uh, today, but also, you know, if you go and uh, follow the law, what they're doing at this point is actually illegal because they're having a... Well, they're basically, they have a trial at night, and they weren't permitted to do that under the law. So they are very much trying to do this in such a way as to ensure that the people don't see what they're doing, because if the people did, they were probably the ones who would end up being crucified. You know, and they knew that, so they were being very uh, uh, manipulative about the whole situation here. And they're doing this at night, so they've taken him from the Garden of Gethsemane, where, where he was betrayed. They've taken him to the high priest, um, and 
at this point, they are seeking a way to have him put to death. But they're running into a bit of a problem. They can't find one because the testimony isn't agreeing. You know, um, they didn't do a very good job of prepping their false witnesses beforehand because they're supposed to agree, but they weren't actually agreeing at this point. So it was at the same time, uh, of course, uh, well, just prior to this, as we go through the trial, ultimately, um, the high priest asks Jesus if he's the Christ, and he says, yes, I am. You know, and, or he, he literally says, as you say, it is, but understanding that, he's saying, yes, I actually am the Christ. And the high priest actually knew it also. So now on Wednesday, as we come into Wednesday, and this would be Wednesday morning, uh, this is actually referred to as the day of preparation for the Passover. Um, John chapter 19 and verse 14 talk about this. And now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. Now that, of course, is going to be rather important here shortly because what they do is they hand over Christ to uh, Pilate because they can't find a reason to put him to death. However, they're, of course, under, they're under Roman rule, so they can't actually put him to death. So they hand him over to Pilate. And so after the illegal trial of Christ before the high priest and the council during Tuesday night, on Wednesday morning, they hand him over to Pilate to ultimately have him put to death is what their purpose behind this is. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 2 talks about this. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Now, of course, he examines them. He, he examines Christ. He speaks to Christ. Um, he, th there is the whole process involved with that, where Christ really doesn't speak at all. He doesn't speak on behalf of his defense. And actually, Pilate is kind of stunned. He's like, seriously, do you not understand that I could release you or I could have you put to death? Uh, which, of course, Christ very clearly says, you only have power if God gives it to you. So here we have... Uh, in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 22, uh, Pilate says to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they say to him, let him be crucified. So there, it, you know, we have involvement of both the Jews and the Gentiles at this point. Pilate knew he was an innocent man, but yet still crucified him for the Jews. And the Jews, of course, at this point, the leaders of the Jews, they knew he was the Messiah and they wanted him taken out. So they used a pilot to actually do that. Now on Wednesday evening, then, we have the crucifixion of Christ. And this is where he's actually hung on a cross and he's put to death. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So here, you know, after the day of preparation, this is, again, this, we're still on Wednesday evening at this point, by the way, and it is the day of preparation for the Passover, and we're about to go into what's called, referred to as the High Sabbath. High Sabbaths are um, specific Sabbaths throughout the year that relate to a feast. So they would start oftentimes the feast. Um, sometimes there was a... a um, Sabbath at the beginning of the feast and one at the end. So the Sabbath after the death of Christ was not the seventh day Sabbath that Israel was required to keep. It was the high Sabbath, which refers to the start of the feast. That's actually in the way that scripture describes this. And you see this over in John chapter 19 and verse 31. Here it says, therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, and the reference there to a high day is not a normal seventh-day Sabbath. It was a Sabbath that related to the feast. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Now, of course, we know that there were some other things going on at this point, and Christ's legs were not broken because he had already released his spirit at that point. So his physical body was dead. And we do, um, on the cross, as we look at what happened there, we see that there are two deaths on the cross. Um, over in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 9, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich at his deaths. Now, this is actually plural here. A lot of translations will make it singular. Um, there is no issue on the, the original. I put that up there, and I also highlighted it. Um, your term muth there 
from the Hebrew actually is a plural. So it's referring to two deaths that were involved there because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So there's two deaths involved with what's happening on the cross. We have the spiritual death. Now remember, of course, at the core, death actually means separation. So spiritual death would be the separation of the, the spirit, which would be our human spirit, from God. You know, at this point, the Father lays all the sins of mankind upon him. We see that over in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. And we also see it in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28. So here in Mark chapter 15 and verse 34, we see what is referred to, well, this is actually when spiritual death happened. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So at this point, we actually have a three-hour period of time where there was darkness going on. Um, we have a three-hour period of time in darkness. It's referenced over here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 44. Now, it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. So we're right at the ninth hour when Christ actually referenced, or you hear him cry out, why have you forsaken me? During that time, we have a separation of the second person of the Godhead in his human spirit from God the Father and God the, the Holy Spirit, which represents our spiritual death. Because remember, as, as uh, humans, because of what Adam did, his trespass separated us from God. He separated our spirit from God when he did that, and he passed that on to us. So we're born separated from God, and now Christ is actually dying also in that same way so that ultimately his resurrection will not just cover our physical death, but it'll also cover our spiritual death. So we have that three. Uh, by the way, the three hours of darkness, uh, Luke chapter 23 and verse 44 the reference here from the sixth hour to the ninth hour would be noon to 3 p.m. Um, so if you actually translate that out, that's what it's referring to. So then we also have the physical death of Christ. So he didn't just spiritually die. He was spiritually separated from the Father, but he did not. Uh, that wasn't the end of it. And there are some passages that say it is finished. And, the, and if you follow the context there, it's talking about the separation from the Godhead, or excuse me, uh, I must be more specific. He's no longer separated in his spirit from God, the human spirit, that is. At that point, it's finished, it's done. He paid the penalty for our spiritual death at that point, but he still has to pay the penalty for the physical death. So there's two that are involved in there. Now, we're going to also see that Jesus' crucifixion did not actually kill him. He gave up his own life. You see that in John chapter 10, verse 18, and Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. Now here in Luke chapter 23 and 46, we see, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So he is the one who actually released his spirit into the hands of the Father. Having said this, he breathed his last. Within the gospel for salvation, burial proves physical death. So remember over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, we have the gospel for salvation. And in there, it's Christ died for our sins, and he was buried. The burial is proof of actual physical death. At this point, in the timeline, we actually have the tearing of a veil. Okay, this is where the, the veil tore from top to bottom in the temple because now Christ has actually opened up the way for us to enter into the Holy of Holies. So the Father lays all the sins of, of mankind upon him. Like I said Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11 talks about that. Um, of course, the reference to uh, the spiritual death and it is finished, all prophecy isn't fulfilled. And we see a few examples of that because, well, for one, he still had to be raised. You know, so that was one of the areas that refers to that. So here in uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 37, and, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, there's a couple of passages that kind of 
it depends on where you're putting this. Um, Luke is typically the best one to follow because he does try to put things in chronological order. But in with the tearing of the veil, um, I think Luke got a little bit out of order because the veil actually was torn after Christ physically died. And this is important in understanding other passages of Scripture because it is through his body that we actually enter into the Holy of Holies. He had to actually physically die. Um, now on Wednesday evening, we have him in the grave. So here in Luke chapter 23 and verses 52 through 44. Now here um, we have this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of stone where no one had ever lain before. And the day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So here again, we're getting the reference to it's the preparation day. And now we have a Sabbath that's coming and they want to actually um, put Christ into the grave. So by Wednesday night, the Jews had succeeded in having Christ put to death. Uh, prior to Christ's death, the high priests and the leaders of Israel refused to enter into the courtroom to stand before Pilate because the next day was the first day of the fast of the unleavened bread, and they didn't want to defile themselves. Okay, just before the sun set on Wednesday night, the body of Christ was laid in a tomb. Now, when, this would be our Wednesday night. Uh, the body of Christ was laid in a tomb with plans later to have it moved to its own gravesite. Now, that tomb, actually, back over in Isaiah, references he was buried with the rich. It was a rich man who had that tomb actually cut out for himself, but Christ was permitted to borrow it. They didn't realize he was actually borrowing it at that point, but he was going to borrow it for a couple of days. You know, and then, uh, so we do have him actually laid as if he were a wealthy man at this point. So both deaths are involved there, and then, of course, we have him not only being counted among criminals, but also among the rich. So they laid him in the tomb. They were going to move him later. And the day of preparation, of course, is referring to the day uh, before the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's what's happening right here on Wednesday. So when we get into Thursday, we're actually um, dealing with the day after the day of preparation, which again is a high Sabbath. Now, three days and three nights in the grave. Um, by the way, this is what Scripture actually says Christ um, spent in the grave. Uh, there is prophecy of his time in the grave. So Christ actually gives prophecy specifically about how long he's going to spend in the grave. We have the body will not be allowed to corrupt. That is actually important because, and this is again prophecy that relates to this, because we actually have an example of Lazarus and why Lazarus was permitted to stay in the grave for four days. You know, and Christ did permit that because remember, when he was told that Lazarus was sick, he delayed going there on purpose because he was going to show them exactly that he had the power to resurrect. So three nights and three days in the grave were prophesied in Scripture. And of course, we're given an example of exactly why there would be no more than three days or three nights because his body would not be allowed to corrupt. And that's basically, well, as we look at it, let's look at the prophecy, prophecy of his time in the grave, Matthew chapter 12, verses 39 and 40. Here it says, but he answered and said to them, an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so was the Son of Man three days, or so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here he does reference three days, three nights. Um, and of course, um, this was done previously with Jonah, as he's giving an example of this. I know some of our translations say whale, but you know, um, it's kind of funny the arguments that will come out of this. Well, a whale can't swallow, you know, a human. Um, well, you know, there's big enough fish to do it. So, the, so here they actually translate it as a big fish, which is fine. He spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish because 
he didn't want to take the message. This is Jonah. He didn't want to take the message to Nineveh because he knew they would repent. And he, he didn't want them to repent. Okay. But he finally, he said, finally, okay, God, after three days and three nights, he was actually in Sheol when you uh, go through that um, study on that. Uh, and God allowed him to be resuscitated. Well, Christ is using this as an example because the Jews knew about this. We also have another reference to the fact that his soul will not be left in Sheol. Now, Sheol, by the way, is Hades. We also refer to Hades as hell. Um, those all three would be the same place at this point. Um, hell is, of course, uh, if you really understand hell, Hades and Sheol and the concept there. Um, we have three different chambers. Paradise at that point was in Sheol. And that's where Christ went. He didn't go to the lowest shield. That's where the unbelievers went. And that's where the fire is actually burning. Psalms chapter 16 and verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And then also over in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. This is after the resurrection of Christ, where Peter, it's his first sermon that he's given to the Jews after, of course, the resurrection of Christ. He's referring to David, and he says, in reference to Christ, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now here it says Hades, because here we're in the Greek, where previously it was a Sheol, because we're referencing the Hebrew. So that actually shows us the connection between those two also. Now, with the example of, of Lazarus and him, him being resuscitated, uh, we see that over in Luke chapter, or excuse me, John chapter 11, verses 38 and 39. Uh, then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of, of him who died, which would be Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. And that actually is giving us a, a reference point to understand that after four days, the body begins to decay in the way where it starts to stink. Well, Scripture says God's not going to permit this. He's going to not allow his Holy One to see corruption at this point. So we know that he has to be raised before the fourth day in order for Scripture to be accurate. So now coming back into our timeline, we're on Thursday. Okay, this would, of course, be the day after the day of preparation. We are actually on the high Sabbath at this point. The day um, here, uh, we have the placing of guards at his tomb. Um, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 through 64, um, it's talking about how the high priests, they actually violate the... Uh, Sabbath, by the way, and doing what they're doing here. But they want to make sure that they're not going to have any problems with Christ anymore because they finally got him put to death. So they wanted to make um, absolute sure that nothing disturbed that. And they go to Pilate. So on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how the deceiver said, After three days I will raise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he is risen from the dead, so that the last deception would be worse than the first. Now, like I said, when we're following actually what's going on here, this is actually a Sabbath. And, and you can go back and when Christ actually implemented this, or God implemented this, the Sabbath of the feast, or Sabbaths of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are seen over in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23 and, and verse 4 says, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy assemblies, which you shall proclaim at their appointed time. That reference to holy assemblies is actually a reference to a Sabbath, by the way. So as the sun set, the high Sabbath came into effect, and no one was permitted to work. Now, again, this is not the seventh-day Sabbath. This is the Sabbath that relates to the actual feast, as it's referring to here in, in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 4. Now, the Passover is going to begin here in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5. On the 14th day of the month, at twilight, so this is right at the evening, is the Lord's Passover. Passover. 
So this is where the Passover begins. We first have the day of preparation. Um, and then we have, well, excuse me, then we have uh, the Feast of Unleavened that's going to begin at this point. So in Leviticus chapter, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6, it says, And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. To the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So we have the Passover, then we have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Christ ate the Passover dinner with his disciples, which had been on Tuesday. And then we have the day of preparation at this point, um, headed in. And then Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 7 says, On the first day you shall have a holy assembly. The holy assembly is a reference to having a Sabbath. And of course, the rest of the sentence says, You shall do no customary work on it. They're not allowed to work on this day. Okay. Then in verse 8, in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 8, it says, But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. So we have a Sabbath that begins the feast and a Sabbath that ends the feast. Not your reference again to the seventh day Sabbath, because they were still required to keep the seventh day Sabbath at this point, but this completely rela uh, related to the, um, to the feast. So when we follow scripture, we see that there are two Sabbaths that happened while Christ was in the grave at this point. There wasn't just one. Um, so let's look at, at the timeline of what's going on here. The death of Christ is on Wednesday night, the day of preparation, as we saw that from passages in scripture here. The high Sabbath, which is the first day of unleavened bread, is on Thursday of this particular year. Um, because, by the way, because the Jews actually follow a lunar calendar, the day of the week can change depending on the year. Okay, So here we actually have the, the uh, Thursday is when this happened. We have a work day on Friday. So this would be your normal work day. And then on the seventh day, we have a Sabbath again, because this is the seventh day Sabbath. So this would be your Saturday at this point. And then the resurrection of Christ is on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. Okay. So now headed back into our timeline, we're back in Friday. So Thursday, Christ has been in the grave. Now we're on Friday. Uh, this is the day after the high Sabbath. So they are now allowed to do work. And we see this in Luke chapter 23 and verse 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and, frag and uh, fragrant oils at this point. Okay. Uh, this is important to understand. On the Sabbath, they were not permitted to do work. So they could not have gone on the Sabbath. On Thursday, they couldn't have gone and prepared these spices and fragments. That would have been against the rules of the Sabbath. Sabbath says no work. Not to do anything that you're, um, no customary work at this point. So this actually happened on Friday where they had to prepare. Otherwise, where would they have prepared this, the spices and the, the fragrant oils? See, there's no place, there's no time in between, because when Christ died, um, they put him in the grave, and then we have evening. So we immediately go into the high Sabbath. If they can't do it on the high Sabbath, they would have to do it on the next day, which, of course, would be Friday on this particular year. Then we come into the normal Sabbath. So they've, pre they've prepared the... Uh, um, prepared the wraps and everything, which I would assume would, it would take quite a while to prepare them. It, wasn't, it probably was not a quick thing that they would actually do because they were going to wrap the body of Christ in these particular spices and uh, fragrant oils. And then on the seventh day, and moving on in Luke chapter 23 and verse 56, it says, and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. That commandment is referring to the seventh day commandment which means they are to rest on the seventh day. So that brings us actually to Sunday. Uh, Sunday, of course, is the first day of the week. Over in Luke chapter 24 and verse, verses 1 through 3, 
we have the first day of the week, and this is when they come, actually the first time they're really able to come to the grave site. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So again, he has been, um, according to the way scripture is actually revealed to this, he has been actually in the grave. He was in the grave on uh, Wednesday, our Wednesday night. So that would be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for, uh, for the Jews because their days start at the, in, in the evening. So here he would have been in the grave at this point for three days and three nights. Um, and they, of course, come and they don't find him. As we're moving on in Luke chapter uh, 24, it says, Luke chapter 24 and verse 6, why do you seek the living among the dead? And of course, this is where they're seeing two angels there at this point, and they're asking them, why are you seeking the one who, uh, the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. It's an absolutely incredible statement when you really understand that. He is not here. The reason his body is missing is because he's not here. He's risen. It was three days since the death of Christ at this point. And we see another example of this over in Luke chapter 24 and verse 21. We're on the first day of the week, which technically is the fourth day because they say it's three days since. It's not this is the third day, it's three days since. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 21 says, but we hope, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Um, and you've really got to understand the way that the Greek is actually expressing it is this is the third day since, not day three. This is day four. Three days have actually gone by at this point. Uh, that's what they're referring to. This is the two men traveling to the village of Emmaus talking as they go along. And Christ actually comes along and he begins to talk with them. It's Luke chapter 24, verses 13, all the way through 21. And they were talking about this, and this, of course, is when Christ opens the scripture to them, and then they realize he is Christ at this point. Um, that's when he, uh, and then he, uh, at that point, moves on to give evidence to other people that he's actually raised. So again, going back into the concept of the timeline and following what is going on according to scripture. Sentence on Tuesday night to be put to death by the Jewish leaders. He was turned over to Pilate on Wednesday to be crucified. He's crucified on Wednesday night. Um, so it didn't take a whole lot of time for them to get this done. And he's actually put into the grave on Wednesday night, which refers to the day of preparation. He's in the grave for three days and three nights at this point, if you actually follow scripture. And he's raised from the grave on the first day of the week before sunrise. Now, we know that from other passages of Scripture, they went really early in the morning. It was actually before the sun had uh, risen that they came to the grave, and they saw that he was uh, missing at this point. So, with all of this evidence, why is Christ's death commemorated on Friday? You know, that tends to be a very predominant focus on Christ died on Friday and he was raised on uh, Sunday. I'm not the greatest at math, but even I can tell that's not three days and three nights in the grave. If you stretch it, you could say, okay, three days, but where are the three nights? I can only get two out of that, at best. Well, scripture said he was in the grave for three days and three nights. This actually, um, when you go back and you try to find this, it is actually very difficult, by the way. It began somewhere around the 4th century, some 300 years after the church began, is where you actually begin to see this. So the fact that Christ died on a Wednesday, it, it actually isn't uh, new information. It's just been forgotten because it's been replaced by false information. And this is typically done by the Roman Catholic Assembly. Now, again, 
it's not really clear where it actually started, but it's right into that area with the, with the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church where you begin to get this uh, heavy focus on Christ and Friday. And that's where he was actually put to death. And then he was raised. However, the problem with this is it actually doesn't line up with Scripture if you follow Scripture. If you put the accounts together, you see that that doesn't make sense. In addition, when you go back and you look at prophecy, does God kind of get it right? He doesn't, does he? He gets it so exactly right to where critics will say, oh, well, this couldn't have been written before then. It had to have been written after. It's, it's way too accurate. So why would he say three days and three nights if he didn't mean three days and three nights? Well, Scripture actually supports the three days and three nights. It does not support the fact that Christ died on a, on a Friday. Salvation through believing the facts. Christ died for our sins. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their perversities. And our translations sometimes say iniquity. Understand what that word iniquity means. This is perversity, and this is a reference in the Hebrew language to our sin nature. It relates to that spiritual death. He actually died, and not only, of course, that would deal not only with our sins, but even our trespasses along with them. So he took that out. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28 says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of the many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. And he's going to, the second time, he's going to appear for salvation. So he actually died for sin, according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures, Christ was raised from the dead on the third day. So a scripture actually says, Luke chapter 24 and verse uh, 5 and 6 said, Then they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, and they said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember, this is on the first day of the week that he actually came. Three days that they came and they found that he was uh, not in the grave. Psalms chapter 16 and verse 10 says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So we know that from other passages of Scripture, he had to be raised before three days. And he actually was, according to Scripture. Remember, salvation comes by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse, um, starting in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. And of course, it goes on from there to talk about the fact that it's a gift because that it makes it impossible for anybody to boast. Grace is God's attitude, whereby he gives a benefit without consideration of merit. Or in other words, when it comes to grace, you can't earn grace because grace does not take into consideration your work. It doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. Because grace isn't looking at that. Grace is God's attitude where he's going to give a benefit, and he's not going to consider whether you're worthy of it or not. He's just going to give you the benefit. Grace through faith, we also have faith is taking God at his word. And this, of course, faith is defined over in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now, faith is a substance of that which is hoped for, the evidence of accomplished deeds not seen. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul very clearly lays out the gospel for salvation. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. On the third day, in the Jewish term, means three days after the event happened. So this is the fourth day. So there's, uh, we're on the fourth day on the Emmaus Road. That's when Christ was raised. So when you count that out, you have three full days and three full nights in the grave. Exactly what Scripture said. Christ died on Wednesday, and he was raised on Sunday, prior to, to the sunrise, and therefore he was actually in the grave, like I said, for three days and three nights. So really then the question comes down to, are you going to actually believe what God says? You know, believe the gospel for salvation. 